I'm going to try and finish this um, review with the third uh, installment of this YouTube lecture. Cold War, the Stalin era. Uh, he partitioned they he partitioned Germany. Actually, the Allies had agreed to this, but if you remember, he basically shut it down. And then he did the um, Berlin blockade. He blockaded the roads into West Berlin. Remember, West Berlin is in East Germany. And it wasn't really American. It was the American and the British and the French controlled it. But they shared their zones of occupation. And so um, he shut all the roads from, from West Germany into across East Germany into West Berlin, which leads, that is called the Berlin blockade, which is leads to the Berlin airlift. And I always teach my kids, that is the first major move in the Cold War. A guy named Kennan is the guy who comes up with the idea of containment but it is adopted by Truman. It's associated with U.S. President Harry S. Truman. And uh, the idea is that, listen, the communists, you know, are all over the place. We can't stop them. You know, we can't go in there and get rid of communism where it is without a big war. But we can keep it from spreading. And so that becomes the official policy of the United States was containment. And that is known as the Truman Doctrine. The Marshall Plan was named after five-star general from World War II, George C. Marshall, who later on became Secretary of State. And in the plan, I think this is like a genius plan. Uh, the, the Soviets had all the things they were supposed to have. You see all that gray there on the right. Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Uh, and, but he wanted more. And I want you to write this in your notes. He specifically was threatening Greece and Turkey now. Uh, Turkey is going to be very important here when we get to the Cuban Missile Crisis. If you look down there on the lower right of this map, you can see Turkey is a white. And then next to it um, is that black area is the Soviet Union. And so Turkey is right up next to the Soviet Union. And so anyway, Greece and Turkey are being threatened. Now you can see Greece there. It's got all those communist countries hanging down from above it. Now Yugoslavia is not technically under Stalin's control. It is... Uh, oh, I'm, I'm looking at the key here. I never paid attention to that. They are uh, communist governments. Yugoslavia was a whole bunch of different ethnic groups under the command of one guy named uh, Tito, Marshal Tito. And he was a pretty tough communist himself, but the United States liked him. Uh, at least we did later on. I don't know about right now because he wasn't pro-Stalin. He's like, we're going to be communist here, but I'm not going to do what Stalin wants. So we kind of ally with him. And we bought his car later on. This is probably after he died. The Yugoslavs made a car called the Yugo. And gosh, it's one that I haven't gotten to show these videos in two years. But I have some funny vi videos of Yugo fails. These cars were just pieces of junk. But we bought them. You remember I talked about the East German Trabi or Trabant. The Yugo was a piece of junk too. But we bought them just to reward Yugoslavia for, for not, you know, budding up with Stalin. So that's the reason you see those different designs but if you look there Greece is underneath there so Stalin is threatening Greece and Turkey and so what we do is we offer all these Eastern Europe and Western European countries money and so I always tell my students you know when you meet the Europeans especially the French and they're talking about how you know we wouldn't have a country unless they'd helped us that is true I always say well then mention to them we saved your butt in World War One, World War Two, and then we rebuilt your country Marshall Plan is economic aid designed to, keep, to, to tamp down the spread of communism. I already talked about the crisis in the airlift, uh, but that is um, decisive decision-making uh, by Truman in keeping Berlin. And the, the deal is let's not let them have anything. And tr uh, Stalin tried to get West Berlin without a war. I mean, he's just going to cut off supplies. Pretty smart move, in my opinion, on his part, but he was outfoxed. NATO, these Western European countries get nervous, so they set up this defensive alliance headed by the United States called NATO, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. A couple terms for you to write down. I really went through the Cold War in such a hurry. I just showed you a couple of clips. It is my favorite unit to teach. But what these countries want is to be protest, pr protected not only by the Americans, but by the American nukes. Remember, at this point, we have nukes. The Russians get them pretty quickly. And any country that's in NATO 
we can protect them with our nukes. And um, that is called the U.S. nuclear umbrella. So looking at Denmark there, they are sheltered by the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Uh, several years later, um, the Soviets formed the Warsaw Pact. Russia gets the atomic bomb. You're supposed to have learned about that in APUSH. Probably used American spies to give them the plans. Uh, the Korean War, I'm pretty sure I drew this up on the board. North Korea is armed to the teeth by the Soviets, and it invades South Korea. And the Americans got the UN to vote to help South Korea. If you remember the um, UN, I don't know if I've told you this or not. We're, boy, we're having a sloppy finish this year. But the UN, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, are the United States, Britain, France, Russia, and China. That's the five winning countries of World War II. Well, the Chinese, even though Chiang Kai-shek has bailed on the mainland and is sitting out there on the island, we recognize him as the leader of China. So the Chinese vote went our way back then. And so the Soviets, if you know how the UN Security Council works, if one member of the UN Security Council, one of the five members, I think there's 14 countries on it, they rotate nine and five are permanent. If one of them votes no on a bill, it nothing happens. They have all five countries have veto power, and frequently, when the um, somebody tries to punish Israel, the United States will step in and block it. Or when somebody tries to punish Japan, we will step in and block it. If anybody tries to, you know, um, punish say Cuba, the Soviets would have blocked it during this time. Anyway, it's the, the UN the UN that decides to go fight. And the Soviets should have blocked it, blocked, you know, you know, the UN sending troops. But they had, boy, it's been a long time since I even looked this up. They got mad about something and boycotted the meeting and they weren't there. So we had the vote without them and we sent the UN troops. But it's 95% American. Uh, and so Eastern Europe, as, as uh, Churchill called it, is behind an iron curtain. In the James Bond movies, they'd say, we got a dangerous mission for you. And he'd say, is this behind the iron curtain? If so, then he's going, you know, into a communist country. And these are known as Soviet satellites. Uh, so Stalin um, dies in 1953. And we talked about, you know, the inter I started to call it the interregnum. That's the English Civil War. But there was a period, a couple of years there, where that horrible possible child rapist, if those stories are actually true, ran Russia, Berea and his criminal buddy Malenkov. But eventually they're going to settle on this guy named Khrushchev. And that's Khrushchev there on the right. And in the West, we kind of like Khrushchev. Despite uh, him, him almost leading us into World War III of the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was a, pretty much a likable guy. I mean, he had to do what he had to do. I mean, he's there to protect the interests of communism. And we're there to protect the interests of capitalists. If we thought their way of life was better than ours, I guess we'd adopted it. We didn't do it. And considering that the Soviet Union is not doesn't exist anymore, I would say that even they realize, hey, this mess is screwed up. But in 1956, he makes a speech, and you want to write this at the 20th Party Congress. This is known as a secret speech. You got to put the, those uh, that in quotes. Secret speech. Well, there it is, right there on the screen. And uh, what he does is they they criticize Stalin and say he was wrong. And then they start focusing on agriculture and consumer goods. So in other words, hey, we're going to take care of our people. And again, I, if I had time, and those of you, some of you are really, really interested in history. Some of you are burned out. I'm pretty well burned out at all, but it ain't over till it's over. But you ought to go look at YouTube, the kitchen debate between Nixon, who was brilliant president. He really was. But he was vice president, and he went to Russia and met Khrushchev, and they get in an argument about, Who's better at providing goods for their people? Which is the stupidest thing. The Russians were never in the league with us. Um, the Suez intervention, that's the Suez Canal crisis. Um, the British and the French and the Israelis invaded. And for once, the American went in there and took over the Suez Canal. Took it away from the Egyptian leader who was pro-Soviet uh, Union. And the Americans and the Russians got together. And I hope I'm getting this right because I rarely teach the Suez intervention or the Suez Canal crisis and basically got those guys, the British and the French and the Israelis, to give it back up. The Polish, I'm not familiar with the Polish uprising, the Hungarian uprising, 1956. 
Water polo game, the U2 incident, we talked about that. Berlin Wall, 1961. It goes up over, over almost overnight, and that becomes the symbol of the Cold War. What's missing here, of course, is the Bay of Pigs, where the Americans tried to send Cuban exiles to invade Cuba. It was a failure, and Castro, who's there pictured on the left, uh, appeals to Khrushchev. It says, these guys are going to get me, and so Khrushchev sends nuclear missiles. I do want to point out here that one reason um, the Americans had nuclear missiles in Turkey, and if you remember that map we just looked at, right up on the border. And I have a funny story I shouldn't take time to tell, but I love telling stories. I've graded AP World History for years. And one year uh, I graded across from this guy who was really funny as heck. He had a PhD in history. I haven't seen him in the last five or six readings, and I'm worried that he is no longer with us. He was an elderly gentleman. And, but I would just, just sit there and talk to him. He was in the U.S. Army. Alex and some of these guys that like are in ROTC will, will enjoy this story, I think. Uh, so what he did was he was in the Army, and he was a tactical nuke officer. Now, we have the big nukes, the big what I call the big mamas, the ICBMs. If we had had more time, I have some fun, you know, videos to show you. And just, I love this whole Cold War stuff. I used to have my students design their own fallout shelter. One of the most fun assignments I've ever done. I did that with my honors and regs, American history kids. But uh, where was I going with this? So the, he was a tactical nuclear officer. And he had to be fluent in, uh, shoot, I'm having a senior moment here. Whatever language they speak over there in Turkey, I guess I'll call it Turkish. He, he was fluent in their dialect over there because even though we had nuclear missiles there, we wouldn't let the Turks fire them. I mean, we're not going to let the, the Turkish people have control of our nukes. They had to have an American officer. And he would tell me these stories. I'm going to make these numbers up here. But, like, um, they had, like, some kind of um, launch. I'm trying to remember how the math goes. I'm wasting too much time on this recording here. Something about how they could fire their missiles, say, five miles but it had a 10 mile blast radius. You see the problem here. So they could fire it five miles. It's a missile, it's, you know, it's, it's an artillery shell is what it is. It's a nuclear tipped artillery shell. So let's say they could fire it five miles. It has the blast radius of 10 miles. It means it's gonna kill them. And so he told me, he says, one of these days, one, one day one of his men was asking him, you know, he said, what are we supposed to do? He says, well, you know that um, we're gonna get a six mile long string and we're going to tie it to you know the trigger the trigger mechanism anyway that's horribly not funny on youtube in class i could have done a better job of that but this guy would just tell me story after story after story and he just that's was his job they were right up on the border with the soviet union now if world war three had ever happened you talk about some guys that would have been toast pretty quick they'd have come across the border and wiped out every american they could find but you know these stories about our nuclear missiles there are true because i know a guy who was in charge of them all right, this is Brezhnev, who I like to call the eyebrows guy, and he's got gray eyebrows and very expressive here. Of course, this is official portrait. Notice the medals because, um, you know, the Russians are really into medals. Stalin did all that, and so you'll notice every single one of these, single one of these leaders we're going to talk about here is old because every one of them had to be someone who was back around during Stalin's time. Uh, and so they're going to have like four Soviet leaders in succession that are really, really elderly. And finally, they're going to go with a young guy. And I think you should know his name. When I say young, he's in his 50s, Mikhail Gorbachev. And you know what happens then? You know, he lets the cat out of the bag. All right. So he comes along. So Khrushchev was kind of a nicer guy. You know, I'm sure he killed a bunch of people, too. There's rumors in World War II that he was down there at Stalingrad. And he did all the executions for Stalin. None of that can be proven now. But because the Soviets are forced to back down on the Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev gets his butt fired. And the new guy they bring along is Brezhnev, and he's going to be tougher. And he starts building their arms up. And this is who Nixon had to deal with. And as I told you uh, way back in class, uh, this is the guy who would, like, grab Nixon and bear hug him. Because Nixon and one of these people doesn't like to be touched. Uh, he was there when the Czechs, I'm not even sure the Czechs tried to leave the Warsaw Pact. Seems like they wanted to have socialism with a human face. You know, Czechoslovakia was never quite as bad 
like Hungary, they were never quite as bad as these other countries. East Germany and Bulgaria, Romania, those were tough places to be, you know. But these guys just wanted to do socialism their way, and Brezhnev sent in the tanks, and that's known as the Brezhnev Doctrine. So you want to asterisk that. The Brezhnev Doctrine is, you know, the Soviet Union reserves the right to interfere in any of our socialist brethren countries. That's some bad grammar there. Kind of like our Monroe Doctrine. We told the whole world we have the right, you know, to fix any problems in the northern and southern hemisphere of the Americas. Vietnam War. Uh, I hate to say this because I know some Korean War veterans, my two uncles, and Vietnam War veterans, but for history kids, they're almost identical. There's a northern part and a southern part. They're both in Asia. In both cases, the northern part is, you know, staffed by the you know, the Russians give them weapons and they invade the South and the Americans in both occasions send soldiers to fight on the Southern side. The Korean War is considered by Americans a win because even though no boundaries were changed, we kept communism from spreading. You know, we contained it. There's that word. The Vietnam War, uh, it was going badly. We withdrew our soldiers and then North Vietnam took over South Vietnam and made the entire country socialist and did what they do in these countries. They put you to re-education camps. You know, as a teacher, you know, it's fun to make jokes whenever they come in with some new bullcrap educational theory and they make us go learn it. And I'm like, you know, they're going to send us to re-education camps. Um, all right, the Vietnam War. Uh, so that's a loss on the American side. We did not contain the spread of communism. That happened in the 60s and 70s, by the way. The Afghan War happened in the 1980s. There should be some years here. And what happened was the Soviet Union did not like the government of Afghanistan, so they invaded it. And they just went and started shooting people. One story, the Russian, you know, special forces like their Green Berets, there's this hotel, the presidential palace is there. And so they, they dropped in their Speznats or whatever their special forces are. And they went up and just started shooting people. When they got up to the top, what the guy in charge was, I'm, I never forget reading the story. He was in the bedroom with some beautiful American girl. I don't know what she was doing in Afghanistan. And they just went in and shot both of them. These are like a bunch of mafia thugs. When our guys went after bin Laden, they shot his wife that tried, that stood in front of the guns. She jumped in front of him and we could have killed her. We shot her in the leg. Well, these guys killed the American woman, killed, killed whoever was in the hotel, the president of the country, whatever. And I never will forget the leader of the unit had told the guys outside, he goes, no matter what happens, you shoot anybody who comes out this front door. He goes out the front door and gets himself shot. And so this is just a brutal takeover of Afghanistan. And so this is their Vietnam in that the Russians send their troops in Afghanistan. And what do we do? We give or sell. I don't think we sell. We give weapons to the Afghans. And the reason this becomes such a big deal, uh, the, we are arming these Muslim holy warriors called the Mujahideen, and there's rumors, I don't think they're true, but rumors that, and a lot of, you know, spy books written on this, that our CIA actually met a young Mujahideen at the time who was extraordinarily tall for that part of the world, a guy by the name of Osama bin Laden, and we armed him because he was killing Russians for us. And so the Afghanistan war dragged on for years and years, Anytime you get stuck in a war and you can't get out, like it's what happened to us in Vietnam, what happened to the Ruskies in Afghanistan, that is known as a quagmire. Oh boy, no rhyme to reason how these uh, facts are dropping off. Solidarity is the Polish labor union. Remember I told you when the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall happens, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start in Poland. All right, so now Reagan is elected president. I mean, look there, you can see his hearing aid in his ear. And there is Gorbachev. Reagan is 70-something, I think, 69, 70. The oldest president, I think, in American history at that time. Uh, I think Biden has him whipped now, at, you know, at least for when he went in. Gorbachev is in his 50s, and Reagan and him met at Reykjavik, Iceland. I think I told you that if you look at a map. Iceland's roughly halfway between North America and, you know, Europe, roughly. They met there in... Gorbachev tried to scare Reagan back into a corner. Reagan, he was trying to get him to cut 
our Star Wars program, our strategic defense initiative. And Reagan says, no, we're not going to cut it. I never forget, uh, during my formative years, Reagan was a legend. And so for the students who, um, who are just baffled by my hatred of communism, uh, when Reagan left after eight years, uh, if, again, maybe next year I'll get this YouTube clip and show it to you. When he left, he went to the Republican National Convention to get them to vote for his vice president, who won George H.W. Bush, George W.'s dad. And Reagan got up. He's pretty old then. Most people believe he had Alzheimer's. I think it's pretty well known now. The last year or so he was in the White House, he couldn't remember anything. But he got up and bragged. He said, when I was president, I did not lose one inch of land to the communist. And so I very much grew up in the Cold War era. And so this idea now that this stuff is cool after all these Americans died fighting this stuff is, you know, I guess it's what you would say is a baby, baby boomer thing. So anyway, Gorbachev comes along and there's all sorts of problems. The Communist Party is corrupt. Of course it is. I mean, you're in a country where people don't have a lot, even though Russia is better off. The Soviets are better off than they were before. And probably in the Soviet Union, you have a higher standard of living than you would say in undeveloped parts of Africa or South America, the Southern Hemisphere, which has always lagged, lagged economically behind the Northern Hemisphere. There's, you know, they don't live like the Swiss or the Swedes. Sure as heck don't live like the West Germans. So they, we call, you know, the free world, the first world, the Soviet bloc, the second world, in the non-aligned non -aligned nations, the third world. So he's trying to fix his economy and fix his corruption in the communists are just, you know, this is why capitalists criticize communism. They say, listen, it t does not take into account human nature. People are just naturally going to want to do the best for themselves. You know, you go uh, to a movie theater, you want to get the best seat. If you're in a hot classroom, you want to get the closest you can to the air conditioner vent. Human daggum nature. And so these people get in the Communist Party because they know they're going to get a nicer house. Uh, all right. The big ones, Perestroika, Glasnost, and Demokratia, which, of course, they don't have. There's all these plans to um, limit nuclear weapons. And I am INF, oh, shoot. I'm sure you A-push goods have that memorized. If you got to the end of the book, we were pretty struggling. I'm supposed to know what that means. I don't. I am pretty sure stands for intermediate. The START treaties, the 1989 revolutions, the end of the Soviet bloc, the collapse of the USSR. You go from Yeltsin and then finally to Putin. Now, um, Stalin had a picture in his office, a portrait of um, Ivan the Terrible. That was his hero. In Putin's office, there's a portrait of Stalin. So, I mean, you know, he, he wants to be the thug these guys were. And so uh, Putin is the former head of the KGB. The new isms, okay, and we, guys, I really hope you don't get a whole lot of questions on this. Um, I didn't give you study guides, as I recall, in the last two chapters. Uh, so we're just going to go out and go over this pretty quickly here. Um, feminism. And you can look at this. I don't know why they're talking about existentialism here. We, I mean, it's obviously still around. A lot of you are existentialists. You wouldn't use that word, but you, that's really, you know, what you guys are, that you're responsible for what you do, and it's up to you to make your life happy or not. There is no cosmic um, puppet master out there that you can dial up and ask for help, supernatural help. That's not my opinion, by the way. If you want to record this and take me out of context. You know, you make your own purpose in a purposeless, purposeless world. Uh, consumerism, you know, that's under attack now. Again, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, and I tell my kids in AP Macro, the socialist and the capitalist both claim they can do a better job giving people goods. So a lot of people say we need to be Marxists so we're not materialistic. They're materialistic too. They just feel like there should be a more equitable sharing of the wealth, uh, increasing real wages. I'm not going to explain to you what real wage. Well, I will tell you it's wages adjusted for inflation, all these things here. And, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about how poor the United States is. 
you know, you know how how poor our people are. If you've ever been in the other countries, I've been to some. Um, their poor are usually a lot poorer than ours, and a lot of our people say they're poor and they have four cars at home, and you know five televisions and everybody has a cell phone. Um, all right, the green parties come along, and you know they're not only you know anti-pollution, but they're anti-nuke. Uh, the welfare state, and so there are what they call the Christian Democratic parties. And so what happened was during World War II, like for instance, I don't know if you want to use the word socialism. I'm, I'm okay with it. But what we did in the United States is basically we had a centrally planned economy. Our government sat down and said, this is what we're going to do. And we didn't call it a five-year plan, but we, but we had a deal. And I always feel like socialism works in small doses and for short periods of time. Uh, if you remember from our um, project, I feel like families, you know, the nuclear family, couple parents, couple of kids, that is kind of like socialism. Although I doubt your parents let you have their money. But if you think of it, it's kind of like everything is managed equally. That's, the, that's my theory. It's when you try to put it on a state basis that you have issues with it. All right, so this is a big deal. The Christian Democratic parties. So these guys in this country would be probably called democratic socialists. There's a lot of quibbling over words. Uh, I know that Bernie Sanders uh, said recently, I don't know, six months ago, that if we just took like 1% of the wealth away from the top 1% of the people in this country that are wealthy, we could you know, give every homeless person a, um, you know, a place to live. And I have a theory on that. Feel free to ask me about it in class sometime. Uh, eliminate poverty and homelessness. Provide medical care for all. Ensure dignity for the elderly. Provide education. Remove the class barriers. So a lot of this stuff going on in the United States right now are goals of the Christian Democrats. And I suspect a lot of these people, this is my personal opinion, I'm not wanting to trigger anybody. I kind of feel like if these people in this country are trying to do this, call their party a Christian Democratic Party, Instead of the um, Democratic Socialists, I think they might have some more success. Struggle is expensive. She comes along and cuts it. Remember they call this cradle-to-grave welfare? I believe this is the last lecture, and what I told you was there's a whole bunch of different names. And you kind of need to know that, well, where we go? This is pretty good. The European coal and steel community. There's a whole bunch of, like, sub-meetings. I, I don't think... In 2021, the year of the COVID, you know, shutdowns and isolations, they're going to give you an essay this tough that you have to do at the end of the 20th century. And so when I was a kid, we always talked about the common market. We called it the common market, and we heard about that all along. The common market was coming along, and now we just call it the European Union. Obviously, the British just left. All right. And so this is the end of a long lecture. Now, remember, I, I'm hoping to save this for posterity and leave it out there. So next year, I don't have to record these videos again. For those of you who are my students this year, 2020, 2021, after you're done with this, the best thing for you to do is go to Marco Learning and watch the new Ritchie videos, not TomRitchie.net, but just go to YouTube and put Marco Learning AP Euro. Those are the best ones to watch. All right.